Well, God bless you. Thank you. What a beautiful day. Yes. What a great congregation. Man, you guys look awesome. Welcome all of those joining us online as well. What a, what a privilege to come together and to celebrate Jesus. His death, his burial, but also his resurrection. Isn't that amazing? What a great week this is. Hey, I want to share something uh, with two people in this service. First of all, I just want to tell you I, uh, I set two goals in 2023. One was to finish a book uh, about my daily prayer habit. And, and the second one was to run a 5K. Well, I finished the book. <laughs> the 5K, I'm still working on it, but we're going to get there. But I have these available. There's some avail They're available on Amazon. You can go to Amazon and, and, and just uh, search your daily prayer habit. It'll pop up. You'll see this book and, and also... Uh, you can get the ebook version of it as well, but there's some out in the Connection Center. Uh, I'm not saying that, just try to sell books. One of my desires and one of my goals is to leave a legacy to my family and to our church family and to many others, a legacy of developing a daily prayer habit. And in this book, it's a very practicum, it's not philosophical and ideological, it is actually a how to use the Lord's Prayer as a prayer pathway or a prayer protocol and develop a daily prayer habit. And that's what this book is all about. It is filled with Scripture. And, uh, and if you read it, let me just tell you, uh, you'll, you'll see my face and hear my voice because it's, just, it's written just like if I was standing up here talking to you. And I want it to be that way. And uh, not something that I'm hoping you capture uh, that would just be precepts, but I, I want you to put it to work. And uh, I kind of prayerfully came into the service and said, Lord, I, I, I want to give this, these two. I want to give these two copies to who you want me to give them to. And I'm not trying to be weird and mystical, but I just felt like the Lord dropped in my heart who I should give them to. One of them, and Pastor Jordan can help me, I want to give this to Chris, my friend Chris, right there on the second row. I want Chris to have that copy. And the second, I want to give this to Matthew Tolbert. I want Matthew to have that copy. I signed them, but, but I signed them earlier and I didn't put names in them because I signed them before I knew who I wanted to give them to. And, uh, but at any rate, God bless you, friends, and may that be a blessing to you. And uh, if it works out for you to get one, grab you a copy out there. They can help you and tell you how to, how to go about doing that. But God's good, isn't he? Amen. Now, in the United States of America, when we think about the subject of walls, we probably think more about fences. Here in Texas, we have fences. If you've got a yard, most likely you've got some sort of fence around your yard. And uh, probably most everyone in the room would have a fence around your yard. We, uh, you may have a six-foot or an eight-foot privacy fence, a wooden fence. You may have a chain-link fence. If you live in a rural area, you could have a barbed wire fence. You could have a, a ranch fence. You could have a, a wood slat fence, uh, fences of different types. We traveled to Scotland, Karen and I did, back uh, we've traveled a number of times to Scotland with the Difference Makers Board. The Difference Makers are the organization that, that leads the projects for translating the Bible into the heart language of people groups around the world. And when we went to Scotland, uh, we noticed that a lot of the roads that outside of the cities, everywhere you go, there's stone walls all around the roads. And these are narrow roads. And I, I was thinking, I'm so glad I'm not driving over here. Because trying to pass somebody on a little narrow road with a stone wall on either side, I'm thinking liability for a rental car. It's just, I can't help but think that. And, uh, but here we think of fences. In, in the text of Scripture I'm about to read to you, it talks about walls that are called a wall of hostility. And so I'm going to zero in on a subject today. I'm going to be very specific 
in my focus, and I want to talk about walls and how what Jesus did on the cross can pull down any wall that you might have in your life. So let's jump right in and read our text. It's in Ephesians 2. It'll be on the screen if you don't have a Bible handy, don't have it on your phone. I encourage you to download the Version app or another app that, that can provide you free versions of the Bible. But let me just begin to read. It says, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. Now, I'm not trying to dumb this down. I just want you to get what he's who he's talking to. In the Bible, when it's written Gentiles, that's referring to anyone that's not a Jew. All non-Jews are called Gentiles, and then he speaks to the Jewish people. So everyone in this room, take a moment. I, it's not an awkward moment. Just glance around. Look over your shoulder. Glance around in the room. You'll notice it's a diverse, it's a diverse congregation. There are a lot of non-Jews in this room. Tell your neighbor you're a good-looking Gentile. <laughs> if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. You say, no, I'm not. I'm Texan, or I'm Nigerian, or I'm Hispanic. No, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. So when the Scripture's written to the Gentiles, you can know we all fit into that category unless you're a Jew. So don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. Now, don't, don't dwell on it, but how many of you that are following Jesus today, you at least have a little faint recollection of what it used to be like before you started living for the Lord, before you started following Jesus? Yeah, you remember those days, and uh, you were an outsider. You were not part of the family of God. You were called a, a uncircumcised heathen by the Jews or an outsider, Paul says, and he says that you were excluded from the citizenship among the people of Israel, and you didn't know the covenant promises that God made to them. You lived in this world before Jesus without God and without hope, but now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Oh, isn't that a good word? See, once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Oh, I, I love sitting on the front row next to that good-looking, brown-eyed, curly-headed girl right there. Her name's Karen. She's my first wife. She's my only wife. And she's been my girlfriend. Since October the 5th, 1983 at 10.40 a.m. in the morning, generally speaking. And I like to be near to her. I like to hold her hand. I like to put my arm around her. You say, oh, that's a little, isn't that, isn't that a little disrespectful in church? No, because the Bible says We've been brought, we used to be far away from God, but now we've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. I want to be close to Jesus that's in her. So I just scooch up close so I can be near. Well, that's not theologically correct, but it sure feels good and sounds good to say it. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and non-Jews or Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with all its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles, Jews and non-Jews by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Now, let me just say this, because I want you to capture the, the full essence of what this is saying. 
that when Jesus died on the cross, when he went to the cross in his body, he took every ethnicity that was not a Jew along with the Jews. He took those people groups, if you please, to the cross and any wall of hostility that would separate them, he did away with it on the cross. Isn't that awesome? So we understand that if we got an issue, <laughs> it calls for a revisit to the cross. It calls for a new stop by our knee bowing and our tongue confessing Jesus as Lord over every area of our life, including every wall that we have allowed to be erected in our life that is not not in alignment with God's heart and God's word. Well, he made one new people from the two groups. And together, say together. Together, together as one body, Christ reconciled. That means he reunited relationally. Now, let me pause because I think there's probably some in the room that don't understand the word reconcile. When Jesus died on the cross, that was God's way, if you please, of taking a hold of the side of the cross, extended it down to the human race with his son hanging on it, and being reunited relationally with people so that they could have right relationship with God. And there's not a lot of ways or many ways, many pathways to God. There is one way, and his name is Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through him. So if you're going to have a relationship with God, you've got to take hold of the cross through the finished work of Jesus on that cross. And what's so awesome about it, he took all of the walls of hostility between us and people or us and God, anything that would se separate us relationally from God. Jesus took all of that stuff to the cross, including all of your sins and shortcomings, and they were nailed to the cross. And God says, you can be reunited with me relationally. You just got to believe and take hold of what Jesus did on the cross. You say, oh, that's just way too easy. It is. The Bible, God said in the Bible that the way of God is so simple. He, this is an older translation. That a wayfaring man, though he were a fool, won't err in it. <laughs> in other words, y'all ever seen those books, Computers for Dummies? <laughs> Auto Mechanics for Dummies? God just made it simple for us because he didn't want anybody to miss out on this awesome opportunity. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility toward each other has been put to death. <laughs> Woo! Isn't that good? Well, don't shout me down while I'm preaching so good. Yeah, our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to us Gentiles, us non-Jews who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near. Now that we're near, now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So, so, now you Gentiles, look at your neighbor again and say, you're the Gentile. Yeah, so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. We're citizens along with all of God's holy people. We're members of God's family. Together, say that again, together. Yeah, together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. It's we are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Amen. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Now, go on a quick little journey with me. I want you to know where walls came from, where walls originated. See, walls of 
Separation between us and God, us and people, originated in the same place. They originated in Genesis 3 in the Garden of Eden when the devil came and tempted Adam and Eve and said, said what God said is not true. The devil to this day, he still uses the same antics. He'll want to tell people, don't believe the Bible. And that's what he said. He said, what God says is not true. He's not going to do what he said. And lied to them, and they believed him, and they ate from the fruit, and they sinned. And then, of all things, I, I, I don't know, maybe before original sin, fig leaves felt different. <laughs> and if you've never felt a fig leaf now, then you don't get this. They are very abrasive to the touch. Well, they took fig leaves and made clothes and covered up the sensitive areas of their body with fig leaves, of all things. Well, and they're hiding from God, and he comes. It says at the moment that their eyes were open, they felt shame, and they covered themselves with the fig leaves, and God came to them, and God spoke to them, and, and said to the, he talked to the devil, the serpent, and said, you've done this, you're cursed, and you, you're going to crawl on your belly. And then he told man and woman, I'm going to cause hostility. He said to, to, the, to the snake, I'm going to cause hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He's going to strike your head and you're going to strike his heel. So the Lord, listen, here, here's the first wall that was created. So the Lord banished them from the Garden of Eden. And he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. And after sending them out, the Lord stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden. And he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Original sin is the starting point where all walls were created. It was there that man was separated relationally from God and a wall of sinfulness was created. Now, every person that's born, even the most sweet, cute little baby that's born into the world is born with a sin nature, and they need to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And when they get old enough to understand, that's why we as parents want to teach our children when they're old enough that they need to understand what Jesus did. And they, we help them come to the place of receiving Christ as their Lord and Savior and to ask him into their heart because there's a wall of sin that separates us relationally from God. And there's a time, you get a picture of this wall of sin, but also the relational walls that can occur. You get a glimpse of these walls when, G, when the Lord told Moses how to build the tabernacle. He gave him a design. This is an Old Testament. The, the tabernacle is where God would meet with them. He led them through the tabernacle. But he gave them the full design. It's to be this wide and this long and have these objects in it. And then in the, up toward the top, you're to build another enclosed area that's going to be called, and it'll have a roof over it, and it's going to be called the holy place. And then there is to be a barrier inside the holy place if I could use the term wall, it's representative of the wall of hostility because nobody but the high priest could go behind that curtain into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat and the angels, cherubim, the gold cherubim were. Only the high priest one time a year could go in there. And that's where God's presence met with them. So see, they were banished from or prevented by a wall from being able to go into the presence of God. It was a barrier, a wall, and it typifies the separation that original sin caused for all people. Now, now walls have many different forms and types. And every one of them, you say, well, I'm following Jesus now. That wall of separation has been pulled down. Thank God for it. Aren't you glad Amen. that that's the case Amen. that you have? But maybe, let me just, I want you to understand this, that even though you're a follower of Jesus, it's possible that as a follower of Christ, while the wall of separation 
and hostility that kept you from having right relationship with God has been pulled down. There's other walls that can prevent you from having God's best in your life. There's walls that can prevent you from walking in the fullness of everything that God has for you. It'll affect your relationship with God, and walls can affect your relationship with others. How many of you noticed when I read that text that God's plan was for people to be reconciled relationally with him and live in right relationship with others? Jew and Gentile, all one people together. So it's possible there can be walls that prohibit, limit, and impede the greatness of God's blessing in your life. And you don't want those walls in your life. You want them pulled down in Jesus' name. Give Jesus a hand clap right there. That's what you want. Let me just give you a few walls. And there, there can be many, and the Holy Spirit may talk to you about a wall in your life that I don't even mention. Yeah. So let the Spirit speak to you as I, as I talk. The wall that I want to address first is what I would call the wall of unforgiveness. Come on now. Come on now. The wall of unforgiveness. You see, in our life, any injustice experienced can erect a wall of division and unforgiveness. There's a story about two brothers in the Bible. These were the grandsons of Abraham. Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Esau and Jacob. And Jacob was a supplanter and a deceiver and had a lot of his grandpa and his daddy in him. Because they had issues, and I'll mention one in a moment. But Jacob deceived his brother and took the birthright. It's like he essentially come up with a plan and stole the inheritance of his older brother, basically, if I could say it that way. And he, because of that, then what was common to people at that stage, there was a patriarchal blessing where the granddad or the dad would place their hands on their children and they would speak a blessing. And friends, uh, let me just tell you, that didn't go away when the Old Testament became the New Testament. What you as a dad or a mama speak to your child and declare over your kids, it has now and future implications. That's why you ought to be speaking the Word of God over your family. You know, you don't want to speak ugly things. And, you know, it's like the old fella that introduced his kids to their friend and said, I'd like for you to meet my two daughters. Here's my pretty daughter. And there stands the other one thinking, okay. (laughs) Felt like a penny waiting on change. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And the words and... That, that child then obviously would grow up feeling like, well, dad thought she was pretty. That means he didn't think I looked very good. And those are perceived ideologies in the mind of that. And that's just, that's just a very simple example. But the words spoken over us have great implication. And Jacob, who was called supplanter and deceiver, He deceived his daddy into giving him the blessing that was due the oldest, Esau. And because he had been perpetrated multiple times by, perpetrated multiple times by Esau, um, excuse me, Esau had been perpetrated by Jacob, well, there was a sense in the heart and life of Esau of wanting to get even. He said, I'm going to kill him when daddy dies. That's what he said. I'm going to get even. That was a wall of hostility. How many agree? He said, I'm going to kill him whenever daddy dies, but I don't want to put dad through the trouble of watching his boys fight. So I'm going to wait till daddy's dead, and then I'm going to kill him. Well, 
Mom helped Jacob escape and went to live 20 years with Uncle Laban and married Rachel and Leah, had a bunch of kids, got a bunch of stuff. And during that period of time, then after about 20 years, God told Jacob, I want you to go back home to the land I promised to give to Abraham and Isaac, and you and your seed are going to possess it. And so he decides to go back home. He remembers that wall of hostility between he and his brother. And he's concerned, Esau's going to kill me when he sees me. That's what he assumed. But they go back home, and to cut, make a, a long story a little longer, he goes back home, and on his way he decides, I'm going to put my family out front, and I'll put them in stages, and I'm going to put gifts out front. So when Esau gets here, he either will be pacified by the gifts or I'll see problem and have time to escape, whatever his rationale was. Nonetheless, he gets back. He, he gets back and Esau arrives and Esau comes and embraces him and they have a moment of reconciliation somewhere, somehow, over the previous 20 years, there was a moment where he that says, when I see him, I'm going to kill him, decided when I see him, I'm going to embrace him. The Bible doesn't tell us when, doesn't say what that moment looked like for Esau, but this is Stephen, not Jesus speaking. I believe that it was the moment where fruitfulness was released in the life of Esau because he that started out with nothing arrives and told Jacob, I don't need all of these gifts because God has blessed me. God has prospered me. I've got kids. i got animals. i got stuff. Come on back and I'll help set you up. Yeah, it was a transition in his heart when the wall of hostility became a flat level ground of reconciliation. The wall was pulled down. That wall of unforgiveness went away. Friends, God wants to pull down walls of unforgiveness in the hearts of people. Now, that doesn't mean you weren't done wrong. This doesn't mean you say, it's okay what you did to me. That's not what this is saying. If I could give you a simple understanding of forgiveness, forgiveness is when what happens in your heart is similar to that which happened with that medical bill that was so astronomical you didn't have the money to pay it all, and the hospital quit reaching out to you for payments. They turned it over to a collection agency. And no longer would the hospital call you. The collection agency would call you because they are now responsible for that debt and the collection thereof. It's what happened with forgiveness. Oh, what happened to you is real, and it was wrong, and it hurt, and it made you mad. And if you think about it, it still makes you mad. But instead of you saying that one that did me wrong will forever be emotionally, physically, financially, relationally, and otherwise responsible to pay me back for what they did to me, you're saying, God, I turn the bill over to your collection agency. And I'm not going to hold them responsible to me. Lord, I'm going to let you handle it from this day forward. I relinquish the right to collect on the emotional, physical, relational, or otherwise debt. And I'm going to let you be the divine collector. And I'm going to forgive them and let you collect on it. And you may have to every day say when you pray, Father, forgive me for my sins. As I release Aunt Susie for what she did to me today. You may have to do it. And it will be an act of faith because every time you say Aunt Susie, it makes you mad. You know what I'm saying? But you're saying, Father, today I receive your forgiveness and I release. And you say that person's name. And the next day... When you're praying for daily bread and you're praying for his kingdom to come, you're praying for forgiveness and you're releasing forgiveness, you may do it for one month, two.
two months, five months, three years, and then all of a sudden, on year number four, day number 700, you get up and you say, Lord, today, forgive me for my sins, cleanse me from the top of my head to the sole of my feet as I release Aunt Susie, and boom, all of a sudden, your emotions catch up with your declaration of faith. And God puts in you the capacity to let go, the capacity to totally emotionally release it, and you just feel a wall crumble in your life. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. It's a wall of unforgiveness. We're not going to let it be in our life because God tells us the Lord is talking to his disciples in Mark 11. And he says, when you're praying, first, forgive anyone that you're holding a grudge against. Yeah, yeah. you got to let it go. Yeah. yeah, oh, come on, pastor. I, I want to hold on to this. you got to let it go. Yeah. So I'm going to say out loud with me, say, let it go. Let it go. Yeah, you got to let it go. That's what Jesus said, so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Paul said in Ephesians 4.32, be ye kind. Tenderhearted, loving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. See, we want God to be merciful. Scooch on over here, God, and love on me and forgive me, but we're going to hang on to that other. He says, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. Yeah, the wall of unforgiveness. Let me, let me touch on another one. I might do another couple. I might just do this one. Then we might pray. We'll see. I promise when I'm done, I'll be through. <laughs> the wall. The wall of personal, painful experiences. The wall. In other words, external blows that leave internal injuries. External blows that leave internal injuries. There's a woman that Jesus ministered to in John 4. It's a woman at a well in Samaria. Now, in the words of that song, it's not on a Christian album that you have. I don't even know how old it was, but it was a popular song back when dinosaurs roamed the land. It said, she's a very freaky girl, the kind you don't take home to mama. I'm about to talk about her. John 4. Can I say that? Thank you, Pastor Jordan. He said I can. <laughs> but y'all get the point, don't you? Jesus is talking to this woman who has come out in the middle of the day at the time when mostly prostitutes or people are ill repute that don't want to be spoken about, looked at with a raised brow, or, or be put in awkward situations. That's when women of that type would come to get their water. It's the heat of the day, middle of the day. Yeah. And Jesus just shows up. He, he'll show up in the heat of your situation. Yeah. So glad for that. Aren't you glad for that? And Jesus shows up. It actually says he must needs go through Samaria. And some people that want to take the supernatural out of things will say, well, what that meant was that the pathway between where he was and where he's going, that was the shortest way to go. But Jesus never looked for shortcuts. He must needs go through Samaria. He was on a divine appointment and assignment to minister to a woman that, as we said, was a very freaky girl. You say, well, why do you say that? Because he ministers to her and he starts talking to her to reveal himself to her as the Messiah. And in his conversation with her, he leaves no conversation or subject unturned. He was not afraid of confronting conversations. So Jesus looks at her and says, go get your husband. <laughs> Jesus says to her, and she said, well, I don't have a husband. And then Jesus says, you're right. You don't have a husband because you've had five husbands. That's what he said. And you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. 
And she says to him, you certainly spoke the truth. <laughs> and then a little later in the narrative, after she has a revelation of the wall yeah. and the one that can pull down this wall of hurt, this wall of personal painful experiences, because I can promise you if she's gone through five marriages and is in her sixth relationship and she's not married to him, there's some deep inner hurt and pain in yeah. that gal's yeah. life. And I'm not being disrespectful of her the way I said it. I'm saying it to let you know that God can take people whose lives have been a wreck, whose lives are a wreck, and when they get a glimpse of who Jesus is, he can pull down those walls of hostility that are separating you from him but are also messing up your ability to have a healthy relationship, horizontally speaking. Not just vertically, but horizontally. Regardless if it's a family relationship, a parent-child, a husband-wife, or if it is a multi-ethnic uh, relational issue, whatever problem we've got, or whatever the painful experience, and whatever the wall that's represented by internal injuries God will meet us there, and if we get a revelation of who Jesus is, what will happen is what happened with her. The woman, it says, left her water jar by the well. <laughs> she had an aha moment where the wall came down in her life. She realized, I have found the one that can heal these deep inner hurts in my life. The woman left her water jar by the well, ran back to the village, and told everybody, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. And it's asked as a question, but it's a rhetorical question that is actually making a statement. Could this be the Messiah? She's saying, I found the Messiah, boys yeah. and girls. That's what she's saying. And the people came streaming from the village to see him. See, friends? When Jesus died on the cross, that cross that God's extending to planet Earth, he extended it, and when he suffered, and you're going to hear about those sufferings throughout the course of this KSBJ daily walk through the week of passion, you're going to hear about his sufferings. He took external blows on his physical body. Yeah. And those external blows to his physical body did something internally just like it would if you got slugged hard right in the face and hit on your cheekbone. It would bruise you. External blows left internal injuries on his body, bruises, and through what he suffered, it was so every external blow that life brings you, if it's marriage one, marriage two, marriage three, marriage four, marriage five, or the present relationship that she was in, Jesus was able to bring healing to every internal injury at the deepest level, and he can in your life too. And if you're here and you say, I've got a lot of deep inner injuries, then there's going to be some walls in your life. And those walls will affect your ability to relate in a relationship of any type horizontally. That wall needs to come down. And when Jesus died on the cross, he did to pull down those walls. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The wall, the personal pain, painful experiences. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for that, Lord. Come on, lift your hands up toward heaven just for a moment and say, Lord... Thank you for pulling down every wall in my life. Thank you for dying on the cross so that every wall can come down. There can be no walls of hostility in my life any longer. I want to touch on one more, and then we're going to pray. This will be my last one, and then I'll invite the worship team to come after I talk about this. Friends, I call it the wall of personal insecurities. The wall of personal insecurities. It's the wall of fear of what might or could happen, and it drives insecurity. It drives insecurity. Did you know that jealousy in a marriage or a relationship is driven by insecurity? Fear of what might or could happen? 
And so it produces the fruit of jealousy, which is, according to Galatians 5, one of the works of the flesh, which is manifest. Jealousy. Insane jealousy. It can happen to the best of us in this room. Your flesh left uncrucified, it will resurrect itself and produce the fruits called the works of the flesh, which are manifest. And they are what they can become a wall of personal insecurity in your life and it can drive you. Friends, you say, well, oh, that sounds horrible and odd. I don't want to be that type of person. Did you know that the father of our faith suffered from personal insecurities? His name's Abraham. Yep. It's in the Bible. Genesis 12. God has already spoken to Abraham and said, son, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed through you. Oh, I'm going to give you descendants like the sands on the seashore. Oh, like the stars in the sky. That's a pretty good word, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> isn't that a pretty good word? Yeah, well, if God showed up and knocked on your door this afternoon and gave you that kind of a word, you'd say, my goodness, I'm not even going to keep watching the blacklist this afternoon. <laughs> I'm going to just take a break from, from binging on this series, and I'm going to think about the Lord for a little while. Yeah, see what happened. God told him that. And then a severe, according to Genesis 12, a time of severe famine struck the land of Canaan, and it forced Abram to go down to Egypt where he lived as a foreigner. And as he was approaching the border of Egypt, Abram said to his wife Sarah, listen to what he said. Listen closely to his words, and it lets you see into his heart. Because out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks. That's what Jesus said. Abram says to his wife, Sarah, look, you're a very beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they're going to say, this is his wife. Let's kill him. Then we can have her. So please, tell them you're my sister. Now, technically... They were half brother and sister. They had the same daddy and different mamas. But that's not what he was wanting to communicate to the Egyptians. He wasn't wanting to share with them the relational composition of his family makeup. That's not the issue. He was insecure about what would physically happen to him, so he reacted through what he said and said, please tell them you're my sister and they'll spare my life and treat me well. <laughs> Who cares what happens to her thrown under the bus in Egypt, but at least he'll get treated well. You see the selfish nature of personal insecurity. It's jealous. It's insecure. It's selfish. Then they'll spare my life and treat me well because of their interest in you. But the Lord then sends a plague on Pharaoh and his household because of her. And Pharaoh called him back in and accused him and said, What have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister and allow me to take her as my wife? Now, here's your wife. Take her and get out of here. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Personal insecurities. Friends, that wall can be a hindrance to relationships of all type. It can drive improper words. It can cause the dialogue of relationship to be wrong. It can cause the dynamic of relationships to be improper. And it can cause the destiny and the outcome of relationships to be less than God wants it to be because of personal insecurity. And you know what's often the case? People cover up personal insecurity with a false bravado of some type, a false support, a false language, a false uh, presentation of themselves, or it can be a false sense of masculine strength and etc. It can be uh, the, the, it goes on and on, and all of that is trying to cover up the wall of personal security, insecurity. But what God wants us to do is to recognize, first of all, that he has not given us the spirit of fear, yeah, yeah. but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 
And friends, if that, try, if that wall tries to raise up in your life, if you'll just rededicate your heart to the Lord, first of all, and say, fear has no place in my life. And then you ask God to do something. Peter says that fear has torment. He says, the love, perfect love cast out fear, for fear has torment. So you pray and you say, God, I ask you to manifest your perfect love in my heart and life today. Fill me from the top of my head to the sole of my feet with your love, God. Because the love that we have as human beings, it can be temperamental. The well, that well of love as a human that we have, it can be so shallow at times, but when the love that you're loving your family with, loving your spouse with, loving your kids with, loving your neighbor with, is the well of love that is filled from God, the giver of perfect love, what it'll do is not only give you capacity to love people properly, but it will also eradicate and drive out fear in the name of Jesus, because fear has torment. So today, we say, God, fill me with that love. Lord, fill me with that love, perfect love that casts out fear, and that wall has to come down. Well, let me just, let me wrap up. Worship team, go ahead and come. Let me tell you how walls are torn down. Walls are torn down through the cross and your willingness to let go. That's what our text said. Let me remind you, Christ reconciled. Let me just go back. Christ himself brought us peace in his body on the cross. He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. That separated us from him or separated us from one another. That wall was broken down in the cross. When Jesus died and said, it is finished, God tore that veil in the temple that I talked about earlier. There in Jerusalem, it was torn from the top to the bottom. And God was saying, no longer are the rituals and the laws necessary for you to come to me. You can come to me personally, individually, through prayer, right into the presence of God. That wall was torn down, and it typified not only the wall of hostility relationally with God, but all of these walls, many more. And maybe as you've sat here, the Holy Spirit's talked to you about a wall that you have. You that are watching online, you felt the sense of a wall in your life of some sort. The cross is the power to pull that down in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So you can live in freedom and reconciliation relationally with God and with other people. So if you today are here to worship and you say, I've got them. I've got a wall in my life. Jesus said in Matthew 5, talking about a specific kind of wall, he said if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar, in other words, if you go to church and you suddenly remember that somebody's got something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar and go be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Matthew 18, if another person sins against you, Go privately and point out that offense to them. In other words, if, if you've got something against someone or if someone's got something against you, be reconciled in that. And the cross is what gives you the capacity to be reconciled with God and with people. Amen. I don't want any walls hindering me having everything God's got for me. Do you? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the victory of reconciliation on the cross. Thank you that we're in right relationship with God and man today through the blood of Jesus. So you that have come to new life, and perhaps you've come today and you'll say, you know, I, I don't think I'm in right relationship with God. I'm not asking you, have you ever gone to church? Have you ever heard about Jesus? Have you given have you read your Bible? Have you gone to a Sunday school class? I'm not asking you about any performance in any way in your life. That is a mute issue in my opinion at this moment. But the question is, have you reached up 
and taken a hold of that side of the cross that God's extended to you and said, I receive what Jesus did to be the only way I can be in right relationship with God. And when you do that and you say, I believe he died and rose again for me, come into my heart and be my Savior, Jesus. You know what? The Bible that I read to you early out of Ephesians says, you become part of the family of God. We're all together then. You're part of the family. You're part of God's church. You're part of this holy temple, not new life church, but the family of God that is an, a place where God dwells by his spirit. And you, you become a part of it by receiving Christ. And I would suspect that in a room filled with this many people that there's some that are here. And it's not an embarrassment. I mean, my goodness, what a privilege and an opportunity to say today's my day to be made right with God and accept what he did for me. So I want to ask you to stand with me, everybody, front to back, left to right, young and old, those watching online. I want you to prepare to respond as well. And if you respond to Jesus, you're watching online, you can just go in that thread down there and say, I asked Jesus into my heart, and we'll reach out. Somebody will locate that and reach out to you. But if you're here today, and you'll say, I know that I need to be right with the Lord, I'm going to pray in just a moment, and then I'm going to ask you to respond. And here's how I'm going to ask you to respond. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, and we're going to pray a prayer together with everybody in the room and everyone in here is going to pray it with us to be your support mechanism as you pray that prayer. But I want us to do this before we pray. I want you to bow your heads and I want all of our prayer ministers and all of our staff to come. They're going to be across the front because not only are we going to pray this prayer to receive Jesus, we're going to, we're going to be available to pray with anyone for any wall in your life that needs to be pulled down. And God's going to do it today. It's going to happen today. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? And before I pray, you're here at New Life. And you'll say today, Pastor Steve, I, I need to surrender my life to Jesus. I want the Lord to come into my heart and be my personal Lord and Savior. And today, I want to take hold by faith of that cross that Jesus died on and believe that He's my personal Lord and Savior. And today is the day that I become part of the family of God because I'm going to pray that prayer and receive Jesus. Maybe that's you or you'll say, I, I did that one time, but it's been years and I really hadn't lived for the Lord and I want to rededicate my heart today. Then I want you to respond as well. But front to back, left to right, you're here and you'll say, I want to receive what Jesus did for me. And I want to be in right relationship with God. I want to be part of his family. And I'm going to receive Jesus as my Savior today. Real quick, just hold your hand up where I can see it. Just lift it straight up and then you can put it back down after you raise it. Thank you. I see the hands at the back on the side. Who else? Raise your hand. Just say, pray for me. I want to surrender my heart to Jesus. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for those that lifted your hand. How many of you would raise your hand and say, I, I did receive the Lord at one time in my life, but I feel like I've just kind of drifted away, and I hadn't been living close to him like I want to and need to. And today, I just want to rededicate my heart and life to follow Jesus more closely. You'll say, that's you. Hold your hand up so we can pray for you. Hold it straight up. Just lift it up, and we're going to pray for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Amen. Aren't you glad that Jesus loves and forgives? Let's, let's pray this prayer together. And let's all pray it out loud. Say, Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I can't save myself. Only you can save me. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose again. And with my mouth, I boldly confess, Jesus you are my Lord. From this day forward, I'm going to follow you, surrender my life to you, and put my trust in you. Thank you for coming into my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give Jesus a hand clap of praise. Now, before Pastor Jordan comes and concludes us, we're going to have the worship team go through this course a bit.
And if you're here with a personal need, a physical need, spiritual need, or if you're here and you say, I've got a mountain in my life, and I want somebody to pray with me, and we're going to believe God that that mountain's going to be pulled down. I want you, as they sing, step out from where you are and come and let somebody agree with you in prayer. And then when we're finished, Pastor Jordan will dismiss us in prayer. But don't, don't hesitate. If you say, I, I really need somebody to agree with me in prayer, as we sing, step out and come. God bless you. We love you. And I'm so glad that we got to spend this time together. In this place, the Lord is in this place.